Hey everybody, this is Adam Want. I am a professor and faculty fellow for online learning at John Jay College of Criminal Justice. I was giving a faculty development seminar that went a little awry a couple of weeks ago and I decided to make it into a podcast. The podcast is a little long, so before it starts I decided to do a five minute executive summary that goes over the handout in case you don't want to sit through the entire podcast. If you want to skip the executive summary and go right to the podcast, click here now and you'll skip the executive summary and go to the podcast. If not, here's a quick five-minute overview of my lecture, um, and then if you want, you can still watch the full one-hour lecture. So looking at my handout, the first thing I always ask is why do you want to podcast? What pedagogical value does it have? Um, and you really should keep that in mind because that might even help you to, to decide what type of podcast to do. For example, if it's the type of podcast that welcomes new online students uh, to a class, I think video and showing yourself might be a good idea for at least one time if you're comfortable doing that. However, if you are trying to convey lecture material, um, video might not be necessary and you might be able to do a narrated PowerPoint. Um, there are lots of ways we could use podcasting to fill our pedagogical needs and there are lots of different podcasting types out there. Um, so that's the first kind of thing I want people to think about. So after that I give six different methods um, of podcasting. Um, there are lots of other methods, but here's just six different categories that I've experimented with over the years. Um, they all work very well. I have examples of successes in all these. If anybody wants to set up an appointment with me, please do come. Uh, I have Pat office hours appointments. Um, but so the first one is straight to video and audio capture via YouTube or iTunes U. Um, what that basically is, is a method of directly uploading um, video of you or a file directly to YouTube um, and you could then distribute it via a link instead of having to distribute it as a file. Um, links are really good ways uh, hosting our content online and having hyperlinks are really good ways to get you know information to our students and YouTube is a great place to host files because it's compatible with almost everything and has incredible bandwidth. Um, if you create an account on YouTube, you just need to know that if your podcasts are going to be over 15 minutes, you have to verify your YouTube account in the settings. It's something I actually didn't even mention in my original lecture and I forgot about and then a faculty member I was working with reminded me about it. So if you want to create a YouTube account, YouTube is a great place to host your files because the privacy settings allow you to restrict the file so that only people with the link can see it. When I normally say YouTube, people think of, you know, people going in and seeing your video by YouTubing it or Googling it, but there are restricted settings within YouTube that allow you to adjust the privacy settings of your video so that only people who have the link or your permission in other ways could view it. And since YouTube is really an incredible source for um, hosting a video, I highly recommend it to people. Um, number two is narrated PowerPoint, um, hosting things online. I strongly suggest if you do narrated PowerPoints, you don't go emailing around the files. They're too big for email usually. Um, and if you put them in Dropbox accounts, it's a little inconvenient for students to download every one of them when they want to see them. These are six different websites that could host narrated PowerPoints. Um, and some of them even help you put them together. I have seen lots of my students do really good narrated PowerPoints in AuthorStream. And if you wanted to check that out at AuthorStream.com, I believe it is, or just Google AuthorStream. Um, that is, it's a really good website that's out there. Um, you can Google the names of these other websites to get their addresses. Um, but they all allow you to upload your PowerPoint slides that you've already made and then do voiceover work with them and then it hosts it online. Some have free, some have paid accounts, but there are just some, some that you could experiment with. And like I said, I've had some pretty good success with AuthorStream. Number three is Prezi. Prezi is a online dynamic um, website that allows you to um, kind of tell an online story. You could use PowerPoint slides, YouTube videos, narration, voice, video. It allows you to throw a lot of things into the presentation. And then it kind of has a distinct look and feel to it. Really go to Prezi.com and check that out. Number four is one of the cooler ones. It's one of the newer ones out there, the Microsoft Surface Pro 3 with PowerPoint. One of the reasons why this is really cool is you could build your PowerPoint slides, then you could put on a headset and narrate it while with the pen annotating it, and that's a really cool thing to do. Um, so that's number four. Anyone with a Microsoft Surface Pro 3 in PowerPoint, you have the capabilities already.
Number five is directly in PowerPoint 2013. You could do your PowerPoint slides and your annotations, and then you could export it by going to Save As MOV File. Um, it would export it as a movie file, and then you could upload it to YouTube or iTunes U or another cloud source. Number six is animation software, and I show a little experiment later on. Um, and the animation software I use is called Extra Normal, and you can go to extranormal.com to see that. Uh, and what that allows us to do is to tell stories using animation. Um, I, I have some animated legal cases, for example, that I use with my students. In the second part of the handout, um, I talk about some challenges. Um, it's really hard to obtain high quality audio and you really need high quality audio for a podcast. The best high quality audio, I believe, um, the best headset, I believe, on the market for under $50 uh, is the Playtronics Audio 648 or 646 headsets. Um, I think they're excellent. Um, if you're going to want to spend a little more money, if you don't want a headset, if you want a traditional microphone, the Blue um, Yeti uh, is a pretty good microphone. Um, but it's, you know, it's about $150. Um, online hosting, like I said before, it's a chat. It's, it's hard to host your videos online, but YouTube makes it so easy. So does Vimeo, by the way, YouTube and Vimeo make it so easy. Um, and you could set your account privacy restrictions so that your videos don't show up when people search for them. They would have to have the link in advance or permission via email or some other way. Um, startup costs or challenges. You know, you want a headset, you want a webcam, you want some software. How do you fund that? Um, this year at John Jay College, we had these PAT grants that covered a lot of people starting up. Um, in the future, uh, people at my college will be able to go to IT and be able to request a headset. Um, so that's some challenges we, we, we need to work out. Living with imperfection, another really big challenge. Um, it is better, we feel, to do it wrong quickly than to spend forever trying to get it right but never getting it right. Um, and, and that's the way we look at it. It is okay to have um, some minor, you know, audio stumbles or, you know, not exactly the way you want it. It's fine. If you look at the most celebrated online teaching website in the world, which is the Khan Academy, if you look at the Khan Academy and you actually listen to their videos, they will make mistakes all the time and say, oh, never mind, let's just cross that out and keep going. It's okay to make a mistake and don't think you have to edit out every single mistake and make it look totally perfect. Um, it will take you forever and it really becomes a time burden and you never get it the way you're going to want it. So just accept from the beginning that it might not come out perfect. You might be able to adjust it a little bit, but that's okay. Number five is the dating of materials. Be careful when you create your PowerPoint slides. Um, be careful when you teach something that changes often. I teach law and one of the statutes I teach changed. So my PowerPoint slide needed to be updated. So my whole podcast needed to be updated. So, so those are some things to think about. Um, most people hate the way they sound. I do. Most people do. Um, so if, you're, if you really hate the way you sound, just realize so does everybody else. Um, number 42 is kind of a joke as part of the lecture, um, but it, it has to do with um, using podcasts to kind of answer students' questions. Um, and if you need help, if you need an emergency and you're part of John Jay, just send an email to pat at jjay.cuny.edu and we will get it answered for you. Well, that was the short executive summary that was supposed to be five minutes, turned out to be nine minutes. Here's the full-length hour-long podcast. Welcome, this is Adam Want, and I'm calling this on a sunny day after coming back from a blizzard to a blizzard to a technical storm, session two, six ways to podcast, maybe. Um, this is Adam Want, um, most of you know me if you're going to be seeing this. This is a nice new picture of me that the school just took. Um, I'm a professor at John Jay College of Criminal Justice, and I was putting on a faculty development um, series uh, just this past week and had a major failure and it was embarrassing enough as it was because the faculty members who showed up early in the morning showed up in the middle of a blizzard 
And it wasn't a bad blizzard. It was a snowstorm. But the ironic thing is, is that faculty development day was the rescheduling of another faculty development day that was canceled due to a blizzard. So here, all these people came out in the middle of a snowstorm um, after re tinkering with their schedules, and they got to this faculty development session, and two out of the three seminars went fine, mine did not. Um, there were some problems, um, a lot, uh, I was told afterward that people did get a lot out of it, but I didn't get out of it what I wanted to get out of it um, in teaching the faculty, and it really stressed me out. And it's a beautiful, sunny um, Saturday afternoon, 28 degrees outside, and I figured, you know something, I have some time, let me jump on this computer, let me use some of my equipment, and let me re do a redo. Let me actually take some um, faculty members and walk them through what I wanted to walk them through a couple of days ago. And the best part is, I could do this with a podcast. So I'm doing this with a podcast, and all I'm doing is I'm running a program called QuickTime, which if you have a Mac and if you hit QuickTime um, up here, uh, let's see, QuickTime, you can't see it because I'm doing it, but you would go to File, New Screen Recording, and be able to record your entire screen and make it into a podcast, and that's what I'm doing right now for everyone. So the first thing that I went over was why. Um, why is the most important question we ask ourselves when dealing with academic technology. We don't want to use technology just because it exists. It's not a proper use of technology. Some technologies are very useful, some are not. For example, Chromebook's a great example. A Chromebook, um, you know, they, they seem pretty good. They're not so expensive, but because the OS and a lot of information is in the cloud, it then requires the school to have a pretty good internet backbone to be able to support them. So even though it looks like a really good idea to go and buy a whole bunch of these Chromebooks, for the school it might not be the best idea. Um, so we, we want to ask ourselves the first question always, why do we need to use technology in the first place? And do we? Do we require a fix? Um, and it might not be a fix, it might be a way to enhance the pedagogy of our class, but that's the first thing answering the question of why we're doing what we're doing. Because what we want to do is be able to use our technologies to fix problems, to strengthen our class, to create a better learning environment. Technologies could do the exact opposite very quickly. Um, it, it could become a headache and a nightmare for students if you haven't properly beta tested it. It can cause issues. I mean, a lot of things could go wrong. You could um, hurt the learning process. Students don't normally get to take classes twice. So if you're trying to take a test out a new technology in your class and you mess up that semester for those students, they learn, they, they miss out on a lot. So the research and development process is, is pretty significant. So the question about podcasting is why podcast? What pedagogically do we gain from podcasting? And we went around the classroom and we talked about several different ideas and topics. One of the biggest ones that we talked about was trying to preserve the essence of the professor um, in the transformation from traditional to online education. That was one of them. I'm not just sitting here writing a paper on how to podcast that you are reading, although some of you would prefer I do. Um, I am talking about it. I am showing it on screen capture, on video. I'm going to be showing you some websites. I can't show you websites as dynamically in, a, um, in, in, um, in print as I could on the computer. Um, so we podcast for a lot of reasons. Some of them are to preserve or capture our essence as a professor. Some of them are to preserve and capture our content of our courses. Some of them are to give assignments. Most of us are used to giving out assignments in the classroom. But what happens when you can't do that because you're in an online class? Welcome. This podcast is on the group project for PAD 713 at John Jay College of Criminal Justice. This podcast is for students in PAD 713, a course in information and inspection.
So I'm not going to sit through this entire podcast. But what I've done in this podcast is I've used a narrated uh, PowerPoint slide medium. And specifically, I used Adobe Captivate to make these slides up. And I went into de great detail describing the assignment to my students. I also had a handout for them, the same type of handout that I would have went through in class. But here, a great use of podcasting was to just went, go into further detail, give examples, try to replace that interaction that we would have in the classroom. And that's the real pedagogical use here. I'm using the podcast to replace that questions and answers session that I normally would have after I hand out an assignment that I lose in an online class. I could put it into a discussion board, sure, but here I can answer the questions in advance and if the students still have a question, they can come and ask it. So if we look over here uh, on the list of the different methods for podcasting, we'll notice that um, number two, narrated PowerPoint hosted online, has many different options. I want to point out that um, it, they're not all narrated, meaning that you don't have voiceover on all of the different options. Some are just the slides with animation or transitions. Others you could add um, audio over. The, none of these are my preferred method of uh, PowerPoint creation. Um, we could take a look at some of them. Um, AuthorStream, for example, is a fairly large one. Large meaning it's been in use for a while. I've seen lots of student presentations on it. Um, I've seen students doing a lot of their own work on it in, in other courses. And what AuthorStream allows you to do is upload your PowerPoint presentation um, and then share it by uh, converting it either to a video or um, using one of many different tools they have uh, to really um, bolster your PowerPoint presentation and help broadcast it over the web. If you go to take a tour down here, Um, it really tells you about many of the functions that AuthorStream has, and a lot of these are pretty good. Um, not only could we upload PowerPoint, but we can upload Keynote. Keynote is a Apple program um, like PowerPoint that I prefer over PowerPoint. Um, and the best part is, is that if you've already embedded music or animation or audio, um, it comes along with it. Um, and we really like that a lot. So when you create it in PowerPoint and you create it with your narration and your music and your video, the best part about AuthorStream is when you upload it, it turns it into a movie, into a presentation file that students could then access by clicking on a link. And out of the six different um, narrated PowerPoint uh, suggestions I've given, I think Author Stream is one to try out first. Uh, features. So we know that we can upload PowerPoint and Keynote and that it brings it through with the video, with the audio. It could bring in any file as large as one gigabyte. Um, if your PowerPoint presentation is larger than a gigabyte, my suggestion would first be to try to scale down some of the pictures. That could be a little technical. Um, the second piece of advice would be to break it into two um, so that you have two PowerPoint presentations, uh, breaking it in half, breaking it into thirds, um, basically you know, breaking down the PowerPoint presentation into multiple parts or segments and then working on them as part one of three, part two of three, etc. Um, AuthorStream allows us to embed, which is wonderful, because um, we can embed in blogs and networks. Um, that works out perfectly if you have a blog, let's say, on the CUNY Academic Commons. Uh, whether or not it could embed in Blackboard is something I would have to go and try out um, and find out, but we could do that. And if somebody wants to try that out, perhaps um, leave a comment in the comment section on YouTube. Um, share publicly and privately. This is really important, just like YouTube. Uh, whether you want um, to share it so that the world can see or just a few select people, it allows you to do that. 
um, convert into a video. This is really important um, because as more and more people move over to YouTube, you might not want to be hosting on AuthorStream, but you might want to send it over in HD to YouTube. And even more importantly, download the final product for archiving on your own. So that's an important step as well. You don't want to be left with a proprietary file that five years from now no one could look at. Uh, being able to download these directly in HD to your computer, then, then upload to YouTube or archive for future purposes is absolutely incredibly important. Presentation analytics. I actually didn't know AuthorStream did this. This is pretty cool, and I might do some R&D and play around with this. Um, I think now that I know that we do presentation analytics, and I'm just quickly looking over some of the capabilities, um, I'm going to want to go more depth into seeing the types of analytics it could do. Let's see. It also gives us a free plugin for PowerPoint so that we could do some author stream um, functions directly in PowerPoint. Uh, we could present live, which is great if you're doing a webcast, um, different channels, templates. So there's a lot of really good stuff here on AuthorStream, and I've seen students do some wonderful things on it. Um, let's see, there's free and premium plans. Let's look at the difference. With the pricing models, what we could see is they have a four-tiered system where the free package is more to experiment and to learn the system, um, create a proposal, create a presentation or two, and then upload it um, to YouTube via video. You can see you can transfer one over here. Um, the pro package is for somebody who uh, wants to use it like a professor or a faculty member. I would say the pro package would be an excellent package for a faculty member because you're getting unlimited private storage. You're getting to upload one gigabyte uploads. You could convert 15 PowerPoints to videos a year. Um, and it does give you some lead capture. Um, but, you know, that's not necessarily needed uh, for a faculty members. That's more business related. Matter of fact, if you look at the business plan, one of the things that you say, see is it gives you 10 times more um, lead capture per month and unlimited conversion to video. And that's kind of the big difference. I would say that if an institution is purchasing this, um, to definitely look at some of the enterprise-based solutions. But for individuals, um, if you're going to be using this on a regular basis, the business plan is more for the salesperson, the sales marketing person out there trying to get leads, trying to sell his product, while the pro version um, is more for the educator, uh, faculty members. Um, and I think that's a pretty good explanation of it. So that's AuthorStream. Um, I am going to show you, uh, here is, for example, a presentation that is created in AuthorStream. Here, um, in this one, it's not a movie, but it forces the user to click the slides as they go through. Gives you transition, gives you animation. This one does not use audio make sure my audio wasn't off. This one does not use audio. Um, but it basically is a tutorial that lets you learn how to use the system in the first place. Um, one of the advantages of having a system, um, AuthorStream could do this two ways. One where you have to click to go to the next slide, uh, the other where it's automatic. One of the advantages of having them click to go to the next slide, um, other than for when you're using transitions, is the fact that it keeps the user engaged, and that's something that's really good too. This is actually a presentation that students did for one of my classes. Um, my PAD 713 class, uh, these are four students. Um, I've, I've blacked out their names, even though they've given me permission to use the material for training purposes. Um, but if you go through it, you could see how they uploaded their slides and audio, and it's hosting it for them. This is a really good example of how AuthorStream could be used as a narrated PowerPoint. This presentation 
serves as a visual and oral representation of our group term paper project on quantitative analysis techniques for PAD 713 Information Technology. Quantitative analysis is defined by... I'm going to pause it and not go through it, but that was a narrated PowerPoint slideshow uh, that um, my students prepared in one of my courses. Um, so that just goes to show you in PowerPoint, they added the audio, then they uploaded it to AuthorStream, and then they were good to go. I give you a total of six different um, to, um, narrated PowerPoint online hosts to play with. Some of them, like my brain shark, um, is fairly new. I think this is one of the newer ones. Um, but their technologies are getting easier and easier. Here. They're they're becoming um, cheaper and cheaper, and ultimately the only way to go out there is just to go play and see what you can do. Um, let's look at number three. Number three is pretty good. Um, number three is Prezi, and let me get Prezi up. Let's take a look at a Prezi that was made for the Khan Academy. The Khan Academy is an incredible free online learning resource and Prezi has a presentation made for them on their website. What's important to realize is that to go from one section to the next, you simply click the right arrow. And you could see that it brings us to the next slide and if we click the right arrow again, it will bring us where it wants us to go. Sal Khan lives in California, outside of San Francisco. Which is a YouTube video, um, and then I can click to the next slide. Um, the thing about Prezi is it uses these transformations from one slide to another, which twist and turn. And if you do it correctly, you could actually wind up telling a really good linear story um, with a lot of different multimedia components. Um, you could use audio, you could use video, you could bring almost anything you like into it. You could, even though it's not meant to, um, just by going forward, you could click into things to zoom in. Um, there are lots of different features that Prezi um, allows us to use. And it's one of these um, websites that I think it's, it's good to go in and play around and see if it's something that works for you in your class. Ultimately, oops. Ultimately, we're not going to know if this is something that could work for you and your class unless you go in and start playing with it and see if it fills um, any of the needs that you have. Um, pricing models, uh, pretty much like AuthorStream, it's free for public use but with a very small amount of storage, 100 megabytes. Um, and this would allow you to play around, to see if you like the software, to see if it works for you before making any sort of commitment. The commitments that are required from there, um, they have an enjoy package at $60 a year and a pro package at $160 a year. And the difference is the amount of storage. Four with the, with the enjoy, unlimited with the pro. They both give you 24-hour support. They both give you control over privacy settings. Um, from there, the only other big difference is the Pro Package um, allows you to work offline with the desktop app. Uh, so you don't have to be connected to the internet, something that might be good for people who take trains, for example. Other than that, we have enterprise or team-based solutions that have volume-based pricing, so these are good for large institutions overall. Um, let's go on from there. Let's take a good look at number four, which is the Microsoft Surface Pro 3 with PowerPoint. This is going to become an incredible standard for educators to use. Um, it's only $800. When you install PowerPoint on the Surface Pro 3, what it allows you to do is live active narration while using the pen to annotate while recording it for upload to YouTube. So it allows you to upload or open your PowerPoint presentation. It records your voice. It records your annotations. And at the end, it outputs a pretty nice file that could be uploaded to YouTube.
Now, I don't have an example of one of these files right now. However, I will get one and I will put one in the description section of the YouTube box um, where this file is hosted. But I think in general, and we just ordered one of these to do some R&D with, but in general, I would say that the Surface Pro 3 is going to be a great tool for educators to get narrated PowerPoint slides out there. The only downside, and we've already experienced this with some of our other tablets, is that the small surface area, I mean, what we're talking about, um, you know, is, is a 12-inch screen size. Imagine trying to teach a class on a 12-inch whiteboard. You know, it sounds like it's not a big deal, but we've, we have tried and we have done this, and it's something that does take a good amount of adjusting and getting used to. It's not easy to write so small and be able to get all of the stuff on the screen that you want at one time. And it's something that really we had to go through step by step. Um, and we were using a different product that was um, a little larger. But I have no doubt that that small tablet size is going to come into play here too with the Surface Pro 3. All right, so we went through the first five of uh, the methods um, of the six, and let's talk about the last method. And before we talk about the last method, let me be very clear that these are just categories that I kind of threw together in my head um, and have been breaking down over time as I become more and more experienced. Um, you know, these aren't based off of anybody else's predetermined method standards. Um, this is how I wanted to break it down for this one particular faculty development seminar. Um, obviously, there are many other methods, some very advanced methods that I teach in an advanced workshop. I mean, there are methods that uh, include professional, professional videography, crews um, that um, involve green screen. So there's a lot out there. But um, little disclaimer, you know, we just went over uh, a few general types that could be very useful um, in online education and hybrid and even traditional. So the last one I want to go over is animation software. And there's a ton of different types of animation software out there. Um, the, le the one that I liked, animation software called Extra Normal. Um, Extra normal. Uh, it's not spelt correctly, but if you take a look at it, you'll definitely get the idea of what you're looking at. Now that we've gone over um, what's basically five of my six categories, five of my six categories um, for podcasting, um, it's time before we go to the last one for me to give it a little disclaimer. Um, these are categories that are not based on anybody else's work or even necessarily what I would consider to be the best practice for categorizing podcasts. They were simply categories based off of what would work best for that faculty development seminar at that time in the amount that I had to do it. So it's more of a lesson type plan than specific methods and categories. Matter of fact, some even kind of overlap. Um, but this is how I wanted to teach it during the faculty development seminar um, so just keep that in mind the the final solution is what we call animation software and it's the final solution we're going over today certainly not the final of what's out there and this animation software is really great because it allows us to um, recreate certain scenes. Let's say you wanted to recreate a courtroom case or recreate um, a domestic disturbance in a con law case or recreate a classroom environment. Um, Extra Normal is a piece of software that allows us to do that and um, we've been able to do it. I'm not so sure if there's any cost relating to it anymore. We did our project about two years ago with Extra Normal, um, and our, our project was called The Digital Detective, um, and I'll tell you more about that in, in a moment. We did it in 2011, and I don't think there were any major costs involved with it. Pretty sure it was all free. <clears throat> Um, but um, if there was, it was very minor, um, and it might have been just to get it uh, exported to YouTube um, in a way you know, that we were able to build into our own website. Um, so we use this technology, this animation technology called Extra Normal, and um, as it says right here, ah, it was recently acquired by Normal LTD, um, and 
it looks like it's temporarily down actually while they're putting it back together. But I have no doubt that they'll put it back together or, or very little reason to believe that they wouldn't because it was an amazing piece of software. Um, but let me show you what we did with it. Um, so what we did with this basically was, and, and please understand that this was an experiment, um, what you're about to see right here. This was what, what, what um, I worked on called the Digital Detective at John Jay College. The content is actually not important. This is not meant to relay content, and it's not even to use with students live in a classroom, although we have used it with one of our undergraduate digital forensic students just to see how this worked. What this really was um, was an experiment in using um, fully ADA compliant, and that's a little bit of a trick word there because that, that's a hard Hard to, hard to phrase what that means, um, hard to define what that means, um, but, but as ADA compliant as possible animation outside of Blackboard, open available to the public in an educational type resource. And that's what we did in the Digital Detective. We used a software called uh, Extra Normal, which I showed you. And what we did was we wrote a movie. We wrote a set of a short movie. We, sh we wrote a short step short set of scripts, um, maybe, a, what is there, nine, ten chapters, so seven, nine chapters, um, the introduction, the, the prologue, the epilogue, epilogue, and then seven chapters. And what we did here was each chapter was meant to be uh, watched by a student every week, and each chapter is the agency or the agency director giving the student who is an intern an assignment. And that's basically how we use this. Let's see if we could take a quick look at this and we'll do it right from the beginning. I'll skip the prologue and go right to chapter one. Um, and you might not be able to hear this wonderfully um, because again, I am not at my office where I have all my sound equipment. I am home. So I'm just going to hold the microphone um, up to the... Um, the speaker, but let's see if we can get this the way we want it to here. Give me a moment. Oh, hello. My name is Director Michi Bach. Thank you for joining me here today for your new internship at the Department of Emergency Administration. This is the Office of Disaster Prevention. We step in to administer disasters and emergencies that were already screwed up by the administration of another agency. Basically, we come in to clean up other agencies' messes. We are proud to report a 12% success rate. You will be working as my digital detective and I am looking forward to seeing what you are capable of. We all have a lot of faith in your abilities to help our agency. And we think you will learn a lot in the process. Over the next three months we will be together. I will be giving you assignments to help our agency be better prepared in today's heavily digital society. You will be writing a series of training bulletins to help our agents in the field be better prepared. So that's all I'm going to do right now. I'm not going to lead you through all of this. Um, but basically, we use this animation. Um, and at times, you know, we tried to use jokes. We tried to, we tried to build Jesus. in. We tried to build in. Hold on. I'm hey, just, uh, this is getting ahead of me. Give me one moment. It was agent. Um, we tried to build in jokes. We tried to build in um, my sense of humor, which allows me to bring my sense of humor outside of the classroom through the animation to the students, which I, you know, which I think is important. Um, and ultimately, you know, some of our animations used multiple characters, uh, you know, multiple characters that might be talking to themselves. I believe we were able to capture so much rich digital evidence from the Wolfram Hart headquarters compound. This is a major win for the good guys. Yes, I agree, Director. I think I am going to reward everyone by giving the entire agency a free Caribbean cruise. How can we afford that? Due to our success on this mission, Senator Brighton promised us a $52 million appropriation to support agency training efforts. 
So as long as we attend a few class sessions on the cruise. We are in the clear. And in the digital detective, what's important to also realize, look down here on the bottom. Um, all of the controls are done in ADA compliant methods so that a, um, um, a, a student who is blind, who is using JAWS, for example, the screen reader, could use this to navigate the, the software because it's very difficult um, to do so if you're blind to be able to see these little YouTube buttons. Um, we made sure that there were transcripts available for each chapter. Uh, for example, if you go to accessibility, chapter three, we have full transcripts available. Um, so we did a lot here uh, to kind of play with this idea of how do we make an ADA compliant website that also takes advantage of animation. And we were able to do this extra normal um, with the digital detective. And I think that we're very proud of this because it was a success. We don't use it live in any classes right now, but that's okay. What we did was we created, we documented, and we made this type of technology available to other people. Um, so that's what we like doing, and you know that's what we're here for. And if you would like to try to make up, um, whether it's an animation for an entire sem semester, I mean, this animation lasted the entire semester, or if it's just for an assignment or some sort of special resource, let us know because we'd be happy to sit with you and help you through the process of this. Um, Extra Normal is not the only piece of animation software out there that works. There were many other ones with different degrees of, you know, different functions and capabilities. And the thing to point out is other than the website and the programming that went behind making sure it was ADA compliant, these actual videos Eight of them plus project information took me an entire weekend to do. I did all of this, all of the videos, all of the scripting, all of the facial expressions in one weekend, um, 48 hours, um, and then had a software engineer throw it all together in the package that you're seeing right now. All right, um, so uh, those are just some methods. There are a lot more out there, but let's go on and let's talk about challenges. We purchased 12 of the best headphones on the market. We tried them under a variety of situations, thinking that it was going to be difficult to determine uh, which one was far superior, being that we had 12. But what we quickly figured out was that this one headphone, which only cost uh, 2441 uh, far outperformed for our purposes all of the other headsets we purchased. Um, and it does so for a few reasons. The first of all is it's only $25, and uh, our budget was up to 40 um, you know, you can get amazing audio out of a $1,000 microphone, but obviously that's not realistic. Um, so $25, great microphone. The second thing um, that was quite interesting, um, oops, sorry about that, is uh, that it has on the controller the ability to adjust the volume up and down um, and to mute it, which is important. If you're on an online um class session with 100 students or 20 students live, it's nice to be able to hit the mute button, see the yellow mute come up, and know that no one could hear you. And um, also what's nice about this headphone is the fact that it actually sits behind the head. It's hard to show you from this angle. No. Uh, so I just spent a few minutes trying to find a picture of what the uh, Plantronics, the Plantronics audio 648 looks like, um, but it's important to realize that it sits behind the head, which means you don't have to look like a stormtrooper um, when you're online with video with your class. You don't have this giant piece of plastic sitting on top of your head or the band running around the top. It very nicely sits behind your head and is very, very discreet or as discreet as you can get with a headphone. The other thing that's really nice is that the microphone is very short throw, and we like that, meaning that um, if there's a noise across the room, it's less likely to be picked up on the headphone, on the microphone. Um, it only picks up what's in your immediate vicinity, and that's a very positive thing, an absolutely positive thing. So that's the Plantronics Audio 648. You should know that I put in um, with the support 
of the Technology Advisory Committee a student tech fee request to purchase 75 of these to loan out to faculty members next year. Um, so we'll see how that works. All right, let's keep on going. So the second challenge I have outlined, and if you can think of more challenges, please just email them to me because I plan on making this into a live document on the Pat website on John Jay Online. Um, and it would be really nice if we had you know, some FAQs um, to put up there. So if you have anything, just definitely ask. Um, let's talk about online hosting because that's the nightmare. You don't want to email your students the file. Um, one, it's going to be too big, and two, if it's not, it's going to be too, uh, the resolution's not going to be high. If you have any video, you really should find a place to host it, um, and I think with audio as well. When it comes to hosting audio, you have some great options. iTunes U is a great option because uh, it allows your students to download it like a podcast and listen to it while driving their car. Um, or commuting underground and I think that is a wonderful benefit um, but if you want video what I suggest is YouTube I think that YouTube is um, one of the best video solutions for us in education as um, individual professors there are some expensive enterprise based solutions that are out there but CUNY doesn't use one right now as far as I know and even if it did, I would keep my own YouTube account because I just really like what YouTube has to offer. And here's what it offers, which makes it so important. I'm going to go to upload up here on the right. So whenever we upload stuff, first of all, you have to be logged in. You have to have an account. Then you go to upload. Here are the things. Here's what's important to me. Number one. Once I upload my file, it encodes it in formats that are different for different devices at all speeds. So chances are, no matter what device my student has, YouTube will have a version of my video for them to watch encoded for them. That's great. The second thing I like about it is its privacy settings. I think it's something that's really important. We could make it public. And what that means is as soon as it's done uh, uploading, an email goes out to anyone who's subscribed to my channel and it, it gets registered, indexed, and it's out there to the world. If you search for it on Google or on YouTube, you will find it. Um, or, or, you know, it will be somewhere. Um, depending on how good you are at setting tags. And we'll look at that in a, in a separate video. I'm not going to go over that today. Um, but ultimately, public allows everyone to see your work. Unlisted is what I use for my class assignments. Unlisted means anyone can see it if you have the link. So I'll put that link, let's say, in Blackboard, for example, and then anyone with the link could click on the link and see the video. Now, is it possible to pass the link around behind my back without me knowing it and save it? Absolutely. But I still think this is worth... Um, I still think this is good enough uh, when it comes to security for certain of my podcasts and when it comes to the, the podcasts that describe my class assignments, I think that YouTube is the way to go. Um, let's see, what else do we have here? Uh, private. Private is great because um, you can either use your Google circles or the email addresses of people that you put in and only those people could see the video and I think that's really important um, so that works out fairly well too um, so that's that's what I like about YouTube it's easy to upload you just drag and drop um, you then have different privacy settings it plays you could even schedule to release in advance which is really cool it plays in a multitude of um, different formats so whether you have an old smartphone or the latest um, iPhone 6 Plus, uh, you should be able to see it. To the right over here, we have some um, video creation tools to help us. We have the editor, so if we want to um, add or remove content or um, overlay some text. We have the Google Hangouts on air. Uh, every once in a while, um, let's say a Saturday afternoon, I'll invite my students to come hang out with me on, on, on the virtual classroom. And they'll come in for half an hour, we'll talk about the class, we'll record it, and then we'll post it for students who couldn't come and see it. 
um, we have the video slideshow. Um, we're going to need to add some additional video content, um, slideshow content, so you can do so right here. But what I really like, and I can't show it to you fully, but what I really like is the webcam capture. And I can't show it to you fully because I don't know if it's going to let me actually start it, being that I'm already using QuickTime. But let's find out. So I hit start recording. It's allowing me, to, it's asking me to use the microphone and I'll hit yes. Ah, it's not letting me. Yeah, um, it's blocking me because I'm already using, all right, let's, before I freeze this up. Um, it was blocking me because I was already using some of those settings um, with, with uh, QuickTime doing my screen capture recording. But what's important to know is that if I were to hit start, it would have just started recording right from my webcam. Um, so there's YouTube capture right from the iPhone, right from the Android phone, and right from the website. And it uses your audio, it uses your, your microphone, it uses your webcam. And as a result, in the end, you get some really crisp, clean audio that works absolutely, you know, pretty damn good. Um, so let's take a look at Vimeo because Vimeo is one of YouTube's uh, competitors. It's um, a little less known as YouTube. I don't want to say less known, but it's not as um, it's not in the public eye as much as YouTube. Vimeo is a little little more quiet, which is pretty good for for most people in most of the things that you're doing. Um, and what Vimeo does uh, is YouTube. It's almost the exact same thing as YouTube. You know, upload a video right here. You can see the current videos that you have. It allows you to upload them not only from the computer, but from Dropbox or from your mobile app. Um, and it also allows for you to um, set it as restrictive. So you need the link, public, or just for you. Um, and all of those things I really like. All right, um, so we've gone over the Playtronix Audio 648. We've gone over the online hosting with YouTube or Vimeo. There are other ways, um, such as putting something in a Dropbox. Um, but you know something? I like these two. If you want some other options, come sit down with me in my office. I'd be happy to go over them with you. Challenge number three is startup costs. Very often there are startup costs involved when it comes to software or hardware. Um, the best I could do is give you some advice. Uh, the first thing is realize that annually, once a year, and the deadline, um, it's passed for this year, the deadline is usually in February, we have um, free call, uh, call for proposals for student tech fee where um, faculty and staff could uh, recommend um, the spending of monies having to do with programs to um, help with the student technology fee criteria that they're trying to improve, um, like computers and labs and faculty development. All of these things can be paid for by the student tech fee. And yes, faculty development included. Um, so ultimately, you know, there are lots of different ways to try to find money to, um, you know, start your, your, your project. One of the things that we have under the PAC grant is we have the ability to give what we call micro grants or these little small grants. And we like that, um, that we have the ability to do that. And it's a really important part of the PAC grant because it really does spread innovation all over the campus. Um, so here's our PAT program, um, um, our main uh, website, and if you look right over here under number four, the PAT grant application, um, we could distribute up to $500 in funding for any faculty member who comes up with a project that is interesting and unique and that has pedagogical value um, and that is rated by um, our, our committee who decides whether they want to fund your project. Um, so if you only need about $500 in startup costs and it's a one-time thing, the PAT program is a wonderful place to get one-time startup funding for. The, the downside, um, not the downside, but 
but the consideration for it is that you on your side have to make up a podcast describing your project and the benefits to the students. There are some review and rating forms. So you kind of have to do an analysis and an evaluation that gets posted on the website so that all faculty members could learn from what you have done. Um, but that could be a really, really interesting way of uh, professors, uh, faculty members really um, being able to get some extra equipment without it costing them out of their own pocket. And, you know, we're not talking about, you know, remote controls for PowerPoint and, and um, dongles. We're talking about, you know, truly unique ideas um, where you could use these technologies, interface them into your class and do some wonderful stuff. Um, so that is uh, number three, startup costs. It's never easy to find money. It's always a challenge, but when you do and you finally have, um, it feels pretty good. So let's go to the next one, which is living with imperfection. Um, <clears throat> let me tell you something. Uh, Pat O'Hara taught me a long time ago, and he's right that we will never be perfect. We will never be able to create the perfect podcast, the perfect song, the perfect movie. There will always be, even in your, in, in your best production you've ever done, there will always be that one error that irks you really bad. And you won't see it until after it's due, or if you do, the chances are very slim. Um, but ultimately... My message to you guys is don't let it bother you. Um, never let it bother you. Um, know that we have to have uh, just a little bit of imperfection because we can't record this over and over and over again. Um, if we did, it would take all of our time and we would never have time to do anything else. And it's just not worth it. One of the most successful examples of... Um, uh, podcast education that I've ever seen, that anyone's ever seen. One of the most successful examples is the Khan Academy. Uh, the Khan Academy is a pretty big thing. And you'll hear him all the time just say, oh, that was a mistake. And, and then just start and just start restart his sentence or um, re-engineer his sentence. He doesn't cut it out. He doesn't change it. Um, although sometimes, you know, I'm sure he might, but you know, he rolls with the punches, he rolls with the mistakes. And that's my best advice that I could give you guys when it comes to this. Um, when it comes to living with perfection, imperfection, know that there will be a great deal. Um, you'll want to edit a lot of it out and do some, but also leave some in and learn to live with it because, you know, it's not like it's 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 going to have a really really horrible impact on anything. All right, let's go to the next one. Um living with imperfection. After that, dating of oh, not liking hearing your voice. Um I think that's not the one I wanted right now. Um you hate the way you sound. We all hate the way we sound. This is just something I found online of a woman who obviously hates the way she sounds. Um even professors who love to listen to themselves speak seem to hate the way they sound. There's just something about it. I'm sure a psychiatrist um, or, or a neuroscientist could explain it much better than I could. Um, but there's definitely something there where we just don't like the way we sound, even if it's the best content that there is. And even if we're leaving there with the biggest smile on our face. Um, and we have video editors and audio editors um, that, you know, in Hollywood spend tons of money to, you know, make small changes to people's voice, but we don't do that here in education. Um, we will hate the way we sound. We will always hate the way we sound. Uh, but my advice is, is really just try to move past it. Um, if you want, come sit with me and I'll give you some methods that I have had to live with and learn, learn and live with. There are two audio imperfections in my voice that bother me significantly, and they only bother me because they've been pointed out by the public. Um, people who have public access to some of my seminars have pointed out two audio imperfections, and they really bothered me for quite some time. All right. 
Um, where are we now? Let's, we're not so far from being done. Um, number five, the dating of materials. You know, we got to worry about both the format becoming dated and the content becoming dated. Because chances are they're both going to become dated and useless. And we need to recognize when that happens. And we need to take precautionary steps. When it comes to the format being dated, when it comes to the actual format being dated, my recommendation is whatever website you use, whether it's Prezi or whatever, make sure that if you create it online, you could download a copy in a format that is universally accepted, such as an MOV or an MP4. Um, there are tons of formats, and I'm not going to sit here going through all of them, but make sure that you could download your movie and keep it on your own hard drive as your property under, uh, under a non-proprietary format that you could look at. And if you have any questions on specific formats, send, uh, you know, send an email to the Pat Grant. We'll get right back to you. Uh, pat at jjay.cuny.edu. You can see the email address right over here. So we know that about Pat. Um, let's finish up. Because now we need just to talk about... Let's get there. Number 42, uh, the answer to life, universe, and everything. Uh, if you get stressed, the reason why this is kind of a joke and it's better for the class, although we never get to it. Um, my joke here is you're going to get stressed and ultimately you're going to make, I don't want to say stupid mistakes, but the more stressed we get, we're going to overlook the simple solutions. That's the best way to say it. So... When I say number 42, that's my way of telling me and my team, it's time to take a break. It's time to step away, start background processing this for a while, get it out of our, you know, forethought, get it out of our, you know, um, our, the front of our mind, stop thinking directly about it, throw it in the background and give a little bit of time to get de-stressed, to think about it from different angles. But most importantly, and absolutely most importantly, what we don't want happening is us just sitting at, at our desks or at our computers, frozen, not knowing what to do. Uh, take a break, take a walk, reconfigure, then come back and reattack. And that's what I mean by number 42. It's kind of like writer's block, but for multimedia. Take that break, then come back. Finally, number eight, the Pat Grant. If you have any questions, send us an SOS at pat at jjay.cuny.edu. That's pat at jjay.cuny.edu. Um, this goes to our administrative director, who will probably be able to answer it herself, but if she can't, she will definitely forward it to one of us who can. Um, I think that's the majority of what I wanted to go over. If you have any questions, um, please feel free to email us at the PAT email address and we'll get back to you. Um, again, my name is Adam Scott Want. Um, I am the faculty fellow for online learning at John Jay College of Criminal Justice, where I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Public Management. Um, and I am really here to uh, 